Mr. Secretary General, I think that the minister has laid out an agenda which reflects what uh, Tony Blair said about not settling on a fixed percentage but a set of building blocks which are realistic, take us major steps in the right direction. I think it's an extremely constructive approach and it's that kind of constructive engagement by all of these countries that is going to make Copenhagen even more of a success than it's been already. Thank you very much for your leadership and Steve, thank you for bringing us all together. Well, now here, it's not just national governments that need to play their part, it's sub-national governments around the world, it's states and provinces. Uh, I'd like to hand the floor over to uh, a long-standing partner of the climate group, uh, Premier Jean Charest, Premier of Quebec. Uh, Premier Charest was actually at the, at the Earth Summit, you were Environment Minister of Canada at the time, uh, in Rio in 1992, um, and have been leading ever since, and actually we worked together on a Montreal declaration bringing states and regional governments around the world together uh, a, a few years ago. Uh, Premier, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Mesdames et Messieurs. Uh, Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. For those who are not familiar uh, where I'm from, I'm from the province of Quebec that goes from the state of New York all the way up to the Arctic, actually. And it's a great landmass. It's half of the landmass of India, which represents a, a continent by itself. And so on this issue of climate change, you can see by that description how it's very much a concern for us, how the impact is felt upon us. Steve, uh, Mr. Secretary General, Mr. Blair, Steve pointed out that I was in Rio in 92. I led the Canadian delegation and, of course, watched uh, very carefully how all of this evolved since then from the Climate Change Convention to Kyoto and now on to Copenhagen. And when the story of Copenhagen will be written, from Kyoto to Copenhagen, one feature of that story that I think is very significant will be the emerging leadership of what we call subnational states. Now, subnational states are American states, its provinces, its landers, it's the Australian state of Victoria, Scotland, Wales, uh, Flanders, Wallonia, the Western Cape, California, Connecticut, Manitoba, and Canada, Ontario. Les Régions de France, l'Assemblée des Régions de France, Sénégal, and Francophone regions, regions everywhere. And one of the new features of the debate that I think we need to seize upon has been the leadership of these governments. Because if some national governments have been wanting in their will and their vision of how we should deal with these issues, I think it's worth noting that some, some of our states have stepped up and have done a great deal to bring this issue along. And there's a reason, by the way, for that. When you look at what the result will be and where the work will be done, 80% of the work in the implementation of what Copenhagen will probably deliver will be done by us, the subnational states. 80%. We are the ones who are going to implement. For example, in Canada, which is a very decentralized federation, we run the schools, we run the hospitals, the provinces, the, we run the uh, roads, we, we are the operational governments in our country. And it's often the case elsewhere to varying degrees. My plea today, given the call made by Prime Minister Blair and the Secretary General, who are saying, asking us to move and move rapidly, is that we need to involve not only all governments, but all levels of governments if we are going to effectively implement the policies that will reduce greenhouse gases. And we need to recognize that in Copenhagen. As Steve pointed out, in 2005, we hosted a leaders summit that brought together a number of these governments. We repeated this uh, summit in uh, Poznan. And Secretary General, I have a statement here of the leaders who were there that uh, we want to pass on to you of support for the work you're doing and our commitment and engagement. And we will be meeting on the 15th of December in Copenhagen to host a third leaders summit so that we are engaged and committed to reducing greenhouse gases and being part of what Copenhagen will offer the world. Thank you.
Premier Shuray, thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, if everybody could remain seated, we ha we've got uh, a few minutes to go where we'll hear from business and civil society. Because of the pressing schedules, I know Mr Blair and the Secretary General have to, have to leave us now. Uh, and, uh, but uh, if we can all thank them for participating. I'd encourage everybody to remain seated. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're now going to hear from civil society and business. And um, I think it's been truly inspirational for me to see the way we've come together as a community where traditional barriers have actually fallen apart, fallen to one side, and the, the spirit of potential collaboration between uh, traditionally potentially adversarial groups. Uh, so we now share the platform. Um, and for the first comments, I'd like to go to uh, our good partner, to the chair of the Tick, Tick, Tick campaign, to a long-term uh, advocate and leader in, the, in civil society, to Kumi Nadu. Kumi. Thank you, Steve. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Today, in more than 3,000 events in more than 120 countries around the world, the Tick, Tick, Tick campaign has organized what we call global wake-up events to our leaders. We feel that now is the time for all of us, government, business and civil society, to stand shoulder to shoulder, to work together, to push for a deal. However, we are concerned that far too many of our leaders seem to be sleepwalking into a crisis that is already affecting far too many people, particularly in the developing world. This is a time not for business as usual. And therefore, on our side, as civil society, we have broken down many barriers. The Tick, Tick, Tick campaign, by its name, suggests that time is running out. And while it is true, and we would accept that we should not ensure that the perfect does not be the enemy of the good, we are concerned that we cannot accept any deal in Copenhagen, but a deal that we want to see should be what we call a fab deal. Not a fabulous deal, but a deal that is fair, that, it, that recognizes that countries and people that have been least responsible for the catastrophe should be supported and that there is a sense of climate justice. A, we want an ambitious deal, a deal that actually stands up to the test of the challenge that leadership is called for, and B, binding. Why we say we must have all three? On our side, as civil society campaigners on poverty, on environment, and so on over the years, we see that deals can be made, treaties can be signed, and they can be ignored willfully. We want a deal now that is fair, just, ambitious, but must, must be binding with clear benchmarks, clear, clear deliverables that citizens can judge their governments on. Now is the time for us to actually say, with 70 days to go on our side of civil society, we want to say to our brothers and sisters in government and business, we stand ready to praise you for the good things and the courage of leadership that you show, but be very clear that if you fail to meet the, the, the task at hand, we will call you out and we will actually put huge pressure and make it an electoral liability for you if you do not follow sense and if you do not follow science. So to conclude, we want to say, that together, government, business, and civil society, north and south, working together, we can deliver a deal that the people on this planet deserve. However, the time now calls on us not simply to say, yes, we can, but to say, yes, we can, yes, we must, yes, we will, because the existence of this very planet is at stake, and it requires a different kind of moral leadership right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. 